Hello, and welcome to a short reading from the book How to Live, A Life of Montaigne, in one question and 20 attempts at an answer, by Sarah Bakewell. The blurb. How to get on with people. How to deal with violence. How to adjust to losing someone you love. How to live. This question obsessed Renaissance nobleman Michel de Montaigne, whose free roaming explorations of his own thought and experience were unlike anything written before. Into these essays, he put whatever was in his head his tastes in wine and food, his childhood memories, the way his dog's ears twitched when it was dreaming, events in the appalling civil wars raging around him. The essays was an instant bestseller, and over 400 years later, readers still come to him in search of companionship, wisdom and entertainment, and in search of themselves. This first full biography of Montaigne in English for nearly 50 years relates the story of his life by way of the questions he posed and the answers he explored. And I'm just going to read a few reviews. By The first one by The Independent. An illuminating and humane book, it's rare to come across a biographer who remains so deliciously fond of her subject. And the next one, Bakewell writes with verve, this is an intellectually lively treatment of a renaissance giant and his world, Daily Telegraph. And the next by the Sunday Times, splendidly conceived and exquisitively written, it should persuade another generation to fall in love with Montaigne. And finally, a bright, engaging book that can only enthuse you to read the essays themselves. Try it and you will make a new, most intimate friend. Daily Mail. In other words, a marvellous, superb, exquisite. So I'm just going to read a few random paragraphs that I particularly like or resonate with or find interesting. And the first part is the introduction, so which is the main thesis of the book, which is the question how to live. Um, Michel de Montaigne in one question and 20 attempts at an answer. Um, I just want to apologize in advance if I stumble over any words and make some mistakes. I'm just going to do it like a one take show <laughs> sort of just if this is just a really um, easy going free flowing type of podcast. So it's not meant to be like high quality recording for like an audio book or something. I just want it to be like really relaxed because otherwise I'll never get through it. <laughs> okay, that's my disclaimer. So yeah, um, so my apologies if it doesn't sound very professional and I stutter and stumble because I'm just reading this as I go along and recording it. One last thing, just feel free to have this on in the background while you do other things or maybe when you go to sleep. I'm sure this podcast will send you to sleep. Okay, let's get to it. That was a really long introduction. Okay, so the first paragraph, she talks about how people are really, in this day and age of this 21st century, are fascinated by their own personalities and they're shouting for attention, they diarize, they chat and upload photographs of everything they do. Maybe that's not a 21st century thing, I'm thinking. Maybe that's just human nature. We just want to express ourselves and we want to connect with other people and we now do it because we're living in a technologically, you know, digital world. We do it via social media. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so she then says they communicate with their fellow humans in a shared festival of their self. 
So bloggers, networkers delve into their private experience. They communicate with their fellow humans in a shared festival of the self. Some optimists, some optimists have tried to make this global meeting of minds the basis for a new approach to international relations. The historian Theodore Zeldin has founded a site called the Oxford Muse, which encourages people to put together brief self-portraits in words describing their everyday lives and the things they have learned. They upload these for other people to read and respond to. For Zeldin, shared self-revelation is the best way to develop trust and cooperation around the planet, replacing national stereotypes with real people. The great adventure of our epoch, he says, is to discover who inhabits the world, one individual at a time. The Oxford Muse is thus full of personal essays or interviews with titles like why an educated Russian works as a cleaner in Oxford. Why being a hairdresser satisfies the need for perfection. How writing a self-portrait shows you, shows you are not who you thought you were. What you can discover if you do not drink or dance. What a person adds when writing about himself to what he says in conversation how to be successful and lazy at the same time, how a chef expresses his kindness. By describing what makes them different from anyone else, the, contrib the contributors reveal what they share with everyone else, the experience of being human. So I really like this part, she writes. By describing what makes them different from anyone else, so basically, when we describe what makes us different from other people, the contributors reveal what they share with everyone else, the experience of being human. So this idea, writing about oneself to create a mirror in which other people recognize their own humanity, has not existed forever. And it had to be invented. Okay, so pause. <laughs> I'm just going to add my own commentary. I think that's why we love fiction stories. We love watching films. We love reading books. We love hearing stories because we want to have that cathartic feeling, that resonance of, you know, I know what that feels like or you're expressing what I've experienced and I'm re-experiencing that through a fictional story. Um, okay. So back to the book. And unlike many cultural inventions, it can be traced to a single person, Michel Equium de Montaigne, a nobleman, government official and wine grower who lived in the Perigord, Perigord area of southwestern France from 1533 to 1592. Okay, so the author claims that this idea about writing about oneself to create a mirror and, and then allowing other people to recognize their own humanity, she claims it's not has not existed forever. It had to be invented. And unlike many cultural inventions, it can be traced back to a single person, meaning Michel de Montaigne. Okay, so then she talks about how Montaigne created the idea simply by doing it. So he created it by doing it himself. So he created all these essays. Unlike most memorists, people who write about their memories of his day, he did not write to record his own great deeds and achievements. So he didn't go about writing his memoirs to write about his own great accomplishments. Nor did he lay down a straight eyewitness account of historical events, although he could have done. He lived through a religious civil war which almost destroyed his country over the decades he spent incubating and writing his book. A member of a generation ro robbed of the hopeful idealism enjoyed by his father's contemporaries. He adjusted to public miseries by focusing his attention on private life. Okay, 
I'm just going to say that that really resonates for me right now because of the current world we are living in. So I'm going to read that again because it's really poignant. And it just goes to show that, you know, history kind of repeats itself and we can learn a lot from history and from the people from the past and find catharsism um, from these books and their writings. Okay, so he was a member of a generation that was robbed of their hopeful idealism, which was enjoyed by his father's contemporaries. So from his, from the older generations, he didn't get to enjoy that hopeful idealism that they did. So he adjusted to public miseries by focusing his attention on private life. So whatever was going on around in the public you know, the misery surrounding him on the outside, he adjusted to this new way of life, into this new world, by focusing his attention on his private life. And that um, reminds me of uh, Voltaire's um, quote, focusing on one's own garden. So no matter what's going on politically or, you know, world events what we can do is we can focus on our own individual lives and you know focus on a project cultivate a project a personal project whatever it is and work towards more inward work so he adjusted to public miseries by focusing his attention on private life he weathered the disorder oversaw his estate assessed court cases as a magistrate and administered Bordeaux as the most easygoing mayor in his history. All the time, he wrote exploratory, free-floating pieces to which he gave simple titles. So I just love the fact that, you know, he, you know, he did all of that stuff, you know, actual active work, you know, for his community, for his um, region, but then at the same time, he created and he wrote these free-floating pieces and then just gave them simple titles. I think it's really important to have s some sort of output for our thoughts because we just end up ruminating over them. And it's I once read that psychologically, it's really good for you and really healthy for good mental health to write down your thoughts, what you're thinking in a diary, in a journal, or you can do an audio journal, which I love to do. Sometimes when I go for a walk, I will just record a personal audio journal for myself, just so I can talk out loud about what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what's going on, my plans for the future, you know, things like that. The very act of talking out loud has a really um, different experience to when you're just thinking but when you actually hear yourself speak the words out loud it, it I can't find the white I can't find the right word for it but it's just really helpful that's probably not the right word but anyways sometimes you know I can't explain something but I, but you 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 know you know you get it you know what I mean okay so I like this fact that it's a really, <laughs> this podcast is just really informal and we're just sort of having a <laughs> conversation, even though I can't hear you back, but you get it. Okay, so all the time he wrote exploratory free floating pieces to which he gave simple titles such as of friendship, of cannibals, of the custom of wearing clothes, how we cry and laugh for the same thing of names, of smells, of cruelty, of thumbs, how, are, how our mind hinders itself, of diversion, of coaches, of experience. Altogether, he wrote 107 such essays. Some occupy a page or two, others are much longer, so that most recent editions of the complete collection run to over a thousand pages so that most recent editions of the complete collection run to over a thousand pages yeah they rarely offer to explain or teach anything so I really like that so he was just writing for the sake of writing just to share 
a piece of him. He wasn't writing to teach anybody anything or to explain anything. And I think that's really important because people don't really like to be preached to. But if you just share what you think or what resonates for you, if people are on the same wavelength as that, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I like that. And oh, yeah, that resonates for me. So, yeah, I think that's really important to do that. That's what I personally do. I just share things that I resonate with and that I like. And, you know, people can either, you know, take it or leave it. And that's you know, the, the type of world that, you know, I want to live in, you know, freedom of speech sort of thing. Okay, so Montaigne presents himself as someone who jotted down whatever was going through his head when he picked up his pen, capturing encounters and states of mind as they happened. He used these experiences as the, as the basis for asking himself questions above all the big question that fascinated him as it did many of his contemporaries. Although it is not quite grammatical in English, it can be phrased in three simple words, how to live. This is not the same as the ethical question, how should one live? So he's not asking the question, how should one live? From a moral, from a moral ethical point of view, he's just asking how to live. But even though moral dilemmas interested Montaigne, but he was less interested in what people ought to do than in what they actually did. So he wasn't concerned that much about what they ought to do. He was more interested in what they actually did. He wanted to know how to live a good life, meaning a correct or honorable life, but also a fully human, satisfying life flourishing one. This question drove him both to write and to read, for he was curious about all human lives, past and present. He wondered constantly about the emotions and motives behind what people did, and since he was the example closest to hand of a human going about his business, he wondered just as much about himself. So it was a down-to-earth question, how to live. S so that then splintered into a myriad of other pragmatic questions. Like everyone else, Montaigne ran up against the major perplexities of existence. How to cope with the fear of death. How to get over losing someone. How to reconcile yourself to failures how to make the most of every moment so that life does not drain away un unappreciated. So he, wants to, so he wanted to make the most of every moment, to really be in the moment, to capture it, to appreciate it so that life just didn't drain away unappreciated. But there were smaller puzzles too. How do you avoid getting drawn into a pointless argument? How can you reassure a friend who thinks a witch has cast a spell on him. How do you cheer up a weeping neighbour? If you overhear your daughter's governess teaching her something you think is wrong, is it wise to intervene? How do you deal with a bully? What do you say to your dog when he wants to go out and play while you want to stay at your desk writing your book? In place of abstract answers, Montaigne tells us what he did in each case and what it felt like when he was doing it. He provides all the details we need to make it real and sometimes more than we need. He tells us for no particular reason that the only fruit he likes is melon, that he cannot sing and that he loves vivacious company and often gets carried away by the spark of repartee. But he also describes sensations that are harder to capture in words, or even to be aware of, what it feels like to be lazy or courageous or indecisive, or to indulge a moment of vanity, or to try to shake off an obsessive fear. He even writes about the sheer feeling of being alive. Exploring such phenomena over 20 years, Montaigne questioned himself 
again and again and built up a picture of himself, a self-portrait in constant motion, so vivid that it practically gets up off the page and sits down next to you to read over your shoulder. I love that. That's my favorite part. Just the idea that, you know, the 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 author is sitting next to you while you read his book. I love that sentence so much that I'm going to say it again. Montaigne questioned himself again and again and built up a picture of himself, a self-portrait in constant motion, so vivid that it practically gets up off the page and sits down next to you to read over your shoulder. He can say surprising things. A lot has changed since Montaigne was born, almost half a mil- almost half a millennium ago, and neither manners nor beliefs are always still recognisable. Yet, to read Montaigne is to experience a series of shocks of familiarity, which make the centuries between him and the 21st century reader collapse to nothing. The journalist Bernard Levin, writing an article on the subject for The Times in 1991, said, I defy any reader of Montaigne not to put down the book at some point and say with incredulity, how did he know all that about me? The answer is, of course, that he knows it by knowing about himself. In turn, people understand him because they too already know all that about their own experience. As one of his most obsessive early readers, Blasé Pascal wrote in the 17th century, It is not in Montaigne, but in myself, that I find everything I see there. The novelist Virginia Woolf imagined people walking past Montaigne's self-portrait like visitors in a gallery. As each person passes, he or she pauses in front of the picture and leans forward to peer through the patterns of reflection on the glass. There is always a crowd before that picture, gazing into its depths, seeing their own faces reflected in it, seeing more the longer they look, never being able to say quite what it is they see. The portrait's face and their own merge into one. This, for Wolf, was the way people respond to each other in general. She writes, As we face each other in buses and underground railways, we are looking into the mirror. And the novelists in future will realise more and more the importance of these reflections. For, of course, there is not one reflection, but an almost infinite number. Those are the depths they will explore. Those the phantoms they will pursue. Montaigne was the first writer to create literature that deliberately worked in this way and to do it using the plentiful material of his own life rather than either pure philosophy or pure invention. He was the most human of writers and the most sociable. Had he lived in the era of mass networked communication, he would have been astounded at the scale on which such sociability has become possible. Not dozens or hundreds in a gallery, but millions of people seeing themselves bounced back from different angles. The writer then goes on to talk about how the effect in both Montaigne's time as well as our own can be intoxicating and she quotes a 16th century admirer who said that anyone reading the essays felt as if they themselves had written it. And then she quotes the essayist Ralph Wolf Emerson who said the same thing in almost the same phrase. It seemed to me as if I had myself written the book in some former life. So much have I made him my own, wrote the 20th century novelist André Gitt. 
that it seems he is my very self. She then goes on to quote an Austrian writer who was on the verge of suicide after being forced into exile during the Second World War, uh, Stefan Zweig, who found in Montaigne his only real friend. And the quote is, Here is a you in which my I is reflected. Here is where all distance is abolished. The printed page fades from view. A living person steps into the room instead. 400 years disappear like smoke. Enthusiastic buyers on the online bookstore Amazon.com still respond in the same way. One calls the essays not so much a book as a companion for life. And another predicts that it will be the best friend you've ever had. A reader who keeps a copy always on the bedside table laments the fact that it is too big in its complete version to carry around all day too. There's a lifetime's reading in here, says another. For such a big fat classic of a book, it reads like it was written yesterday. Although if it had been written yesterday, he'd have been all over Hello Magazine by now. All this can happen because the essays has no great meaning, no point to make, no argument to advance. It does not have designs on you. You can do as you please with it. Montaigne lets his material pour out and never worries if he has said one thing on one page and the opposite over leaf or even in the next sentence. He could have taken as his motto Walt Whitman's lines. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Every few phrases, a new way of looking at things occurs to him, so he changes direction. Even when his thoughts are most irrational and dream and dreamlike, his writing follows them. I cannot keep my subject still, he says. It goes along befuddled and staggering with a natural drunkenness. Anyone is free to go with him as far as seems desirable and let him meander off by himself. If it doesn't, sooner or later your paths will cross again. Having created a new genre by writing in this way, Montaigne created essays, his new term for it. Today, the word essay falls with a dull thud. It reminds many people of the exercises imposed at school or college to test knowledge of the reading list, reworkings of other writers' arguments. With a boring introduction and a facile conclusion stuck into each end like two forks in a corn cob. Discourses of that sort existed in Montaigne's day, but essays did not. A sayer in French simply means to try, means simply to try. To essay something is to test it or taste it or give it a whirl. So I just want to repeat that again. A sayer in French means simply to try. So when you're writing an essay, to essay something, it's to taste it, to test it out, to give it a whirl. One 17th century Montaigneist defined it as, a f as firing a pistol to see if it shoots straight or trying out a horse to see if it handles well. On the whole, Montaigne discovered that the pistol shot all over the place and the horse galloped out of control, but this did not bother him. He was delighted to see his work come out so unpredictably. I think it's pretty amazing that we've figured out the origin of the essay concept and it comes down to this one um, writer. He may never have planned to create a one-man literary revolution, but in retrospect, he knew what he had done. It is the only book in the world of its kind, he wrote, a book with a wild and eccentric plan, or, as more often seemed the case, with no plan at all. The essays was not written in neat order from beginning to end. 
It grew by slow incrustation, like a coral reef, from 1572 to 1592. The only thing that eventually stopped it was Montaigne's death. Looked at another way, it never stopped at all. It continued to grow, not through endless writing, but through endless reading. From the first 16th century neighbour or friend to browse through a draft from Montaigne's desk to the very last human being or other conscious entity to extract it from the memory banks of a future virtual library, every new reading means a new essays. Readers approach him from their private perspectives, contributing their own experience of life. At the same time, these experiences are moulded by broad trends, which come and go in leisurely formation. Anyone looking over 430 years of Montaigne reading can see these trends building up and dissolving like clouds in the sky or crowds on a railway platform between commuter trains. Each way of reading seems natural while it is on the scene. Then a new style comes in and the old one departs, sometimes becoming so outmoded that it is barely comprehensible to anyone but historians. The Essays is thus much more than a book. It is a centuries-long conversation between Montaigne and all those who have got to know him, a conversation which changes through history, while starting out afresh almost every time with that cry of, how did he know all that about me? Mostly, it remains a two-person encounter between writer and reader, but sidelong chat goes on among the readers too, consciously or not. Each generation approaches Montaigne with expectations derived from his contemporaries and predecessors. As the story goes on, the scene becomes more crowded. It turns from a private dinner party to a great lively banquet, with Montaigne as an unwitting master of ceremonies. Montaigne said, There is no escaping our own perspective. We can walk only on our own legs and sit only on our own bum. <laughs> Most of those who come to the essays want something from it. They may be seeking entertainment or enlightenment or historical understanding or something more personal. As the novelist Gustav Flaubert I don't know if I said that right, advised a friend who was wondering how to approach Montaigne. Don't read him as children do, for amusement, nor as the ambitious do, to be instructed. No, read him in order to live. I'll say that again. Read him in order to live. Impressed by Flaubert's command, I'm taking the Renaissance question, how to live. So this is um, Sarah Bakewell saying what her um, aim is for the book that she's written. The question remains the same throughout, but the chapters take the form of 20 different answers, each an answer that Montaigne might be imagined as having given. In reality, he usually responded to questions with flurries of further questions and a profusion of anecdotes often all pointing in different directions and leading to contradictory conclusions. The questions and stories were his answers or further ways of trying to question out. And Sarah says that similarly, each of the 20 possible answers in this book will take the form of something anecdotal, an episode or theme from Montaigne's life or from the lives of his readers. There'll be no neat solutions, but these 20 essays as an, at an answer will allow us to eavesdrop on snippets of the long conversation and to enjoy the company of Montaigne himself. And that is the end of the preface. So in the book, each chapter has the same question, which is how to live. And then she 
gives a different answer based on Montaigne's writings. So, for example, chapter one, a uh, question is how to live. Answer, don't worry about death. Um, chapter two, the answer is pay attention. Starting to write stream of consciousness. Chapter four, I really like this one. Read a lot, forget most of what you read and be slow witted. Um, I really like that one because I always feel really conscious about how I read, but then I forget most of the stuff that I read. And he says, that's okay to do. So, so that's the end of this particular episode. I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, so it's a really interesting book and I'm going to continue reading it. And if I come across anything interesting, I might make a future episode. Okay, bye.